Well, it's good to have you here tonight. If you'll turn to 1 John chapter 5, that's where we'll be tonight. We're just going to cover 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 tonight. Um, it's good to have you with us. Uh, we've been going through the, the book of 1 John. We should be in it a few more weeks, two more weeks at the most, and then we will be done and we'll start another series um, after that. Not a book, but a series, okay? So 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 is where we'll start. We're going to read the whole thing tonight first, 1 through 5, and then we'll, I'll uh, let you know where we're going to go tonight. So 5-1, here we go. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Verse 4, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Okay, so tonight I want to do something a little different. I want us to start with the end goal of this passage. The end result of having faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And then from there we're going to backtrack and see what the process is and how we get there. But the end goal is found in 4 and 5. So we're going to read it again, okay? 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So the end goal tonight, the end result of our time together, is to overcome the world. All right, To overcome the world. And the way that we do that is through faith. And we're going to talk about that faith in a minute. But first we need to talk about overcoming the world. You might, it might sound like we're getting a little ahead of ourselves trying to conquer the world or something, right? Um, But we we need to explain it. What does it mean to overcome the world? And why is it something that we need? Or why is it something that we should want to do to overcome the world? Why can't we just take the world as it comes and just be happy with that? We need to get into why should we want to overcome the world? Why is he writing about this? To do that, we need to flip to Genesis chapter 3. So keep your finger in 1 John, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 3 for a bit um, and talk about overcoming the world. We're going to start in Genesis, as we often do, because when you talk about the Bible, you can't ever talk about the Bible without talking about sin. It's pointless to do. There's preachers out there that try it. They might attract large congregations, but they are not preaching the true Word of God. Because to read the Bible accurately at all, you have to talk about sin every once in a while. And when you start talking about trying to overcome the world, sin's going to come in in a big way. God, in Genesis, we'll get to Genesis 3 in a minute, but just stay with me. In Genesis, we learn about God creating the world, and He called it good. And this indicates to us that nothing needs to be overcome yet. Okay, so the, the, the world like God created it, He called it good. It doesn't need to be overcome but you, because you don't have to overcome good things. Are you follow me? Only bad things need to overcome, be overcome. Good things, you are supposed to enjoy them. You don't try to overcome them. You try to enjoy them and keep them around as long as possible. But then Adam and Eve start to doubt God and his goodness because Satan puts a little bird in Eve's ear and then in Adam's ear as well. And he convinces them that God is holding out on them and that God, uh, there's so much more blessing that God uh, should be able or should be giving them, but uh, he's withholding something from them. So he plants seeds of doubt in Adam and Eve's hearts, and they sin against him by eating the one fruit that God told them, hey, don't eat of this fruit. You can have all the other fruit in this huge garden I've given you, just don't eat this one. And Satan has convinced them that it's that one that they need to be like God. And they go after it, they eat of the fruit, and sin is introduced into our world. Now, the world is no longer like it was pre-Genesis 3. We find that story in Genesis 3. We'll read about some stuff in a minute from that chapter. But this is a story we find. Before that, it was good, but now it's not. Now, no doubt you can find remnants of God's goodness in life, okay? You can have uh, children. You can look out into nature and see God's goodness. You see God's goodness all over the place. You enjoy it every single day. But it is not like it was supposed to be. There's only remnants. It is not fully 100% good like God created it to be. Um, By and large, this world is fractured. And here's the deal. When we sin against the God Almighty uh, 
creator of the universe, there are consequences to pay. And that's where we're going to pick up Genesis 3, uh, 14 through 19. Listen to this. The Lord God said to the serpent first, here he says, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now to the woman he said this, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Can I get amen from the women? Okay. I don't know anything about it, but y'all do. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule against you. Now, can I get an amen from the men, right? Another word for for there is against. Your, sh- your desire shall be against your husband. Okay, amen. Uh, and verse 17. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So God creates the world good, and up until Genesis 3, there's no such thing as war and warfare language. But sin is introduced into our world, and now for the first time in the short history of mankind, warfare language is introduced. All right, the women are going to have to overcome childbearing. It's not going to be a piece of cake anymore. Men are going to have to uh, fight at the ground to make it yield its produce for him, while all the while it's fighting back at him. Work is no longer um, just easy for man and completely enjoyable. No doubt we enjoy work, but it's been tainted somewhat. And then, most importantly, all mankind now will have to overcome death. And we're going to have to do it from a position of being dust. So how does someone who is but dust overcome death itself? These, or this is the question that mankind has been faced with since Genesis 3. How do you overcome death when you're dust? There have been all sorts of ideas on how we're going to overcome death. I don't know if you know this or not, but death and fear of death uh, rules the world. It rules the world. People know. People try to tell you they don't believe in an afterlife, but they absolutely do. And we know that because of Ecclesiastes 3.11. God says, I put eternity in the hearts of men. And so the minute a little child is born, that little child will exist forever, eternally, either in heaven or hell. And so people can tell you, I don't believe in an afterlife, but they absolutely do because eternity in their hearts. And when they're all alone and when the cameras are off or no one's watching, I know they're thinking about it. And so we've had all sorts of ways to try to deal with death and the fear of death. Uh, The old Stoics, okay, around the time Jesus walked the earth, they believed that if you could just conquer your fallen emotions, okay, your evil emotions, through your mind and your reason, then you would become one with the cosmos. And that was salvation for them, all right? Buddhism is much the same. If you can overcome your fallen desires and your passions, then you will attain nirvana, which is a state of Uh, complete bliss, unhindered by all of the attachments that we find ourselves in the world. Islam teaches that if you would follow the five pillars of Islam, uh, then you would have a shot of Allah pardoning you. And then philosophy, which is not a religion, but some people think was invented as kind of an alternative to religion. Uh, One author says that philosophy is the the attempt or the conquest, or the, the quest for salvation without a God, okay? So they're going to, philosophers, by and large, are going to try to attain, uh, or try to overcome the fear of death, not through a transcendent God, but by their mind and their reason and logic alone. So all of mankind, doesn't matter what background you're from, what country you were born in, what color your skin is, everyone has a fear of death. Everyone wants to know how do you overcome death. And Christianity, here's what you need to understand. Christianity is no different. We have that thought as well. That's why, that's why John's writing about it. Look, you want to know how to overcome the world? Faith. We'll talk about that in a minute. We'll get to it right now, actually. We have an answer for the fear of death and how to overcome death. And it is like John told us in 1 John 5, 4. It's our faith. So flip back to 1 John. We're done with Genesis 3. Flip back to 1 John and we're going to get busy here on uh, faith. And what type of faith are we talking about here, all right? 
Look at just verse 1 right now. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. That's all we're going to talk about right now. So everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now, a lot of people just want to talk about faith and generalities. If you just have faith, then you'll be good, all right? Uh, we're, we're all walking up the same mountain, and it doesn't matter who you have faith in because whatever that is will turn into whatever you're looking for, and it'll be up at the top of the mountain. Uh, but here's the problem with that um, way of thinking is that John here has a very specific type of faith in mind. He doesn't just want you to be some hopeful person that has faith. He wants you to have faith in one specific thing, namely one specific person, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay, When he says uh, in verse 4, the victory that has overcome the world is our faith, he uses the same word, the noun form of the word believe that is used in verse 1 and verse 5. All right, It's the same idea. Our faith is the faith in Jesus Christ that he is talking about. If you want to overcome the world, have faith in Jesus. Here's what I have to ask myself if you're a thinking person. I'm a thinking person. I try to think sometimes. My wife would say differently. Um, <laughs> I found I don't think about a lot of things. Anyways. Uh, that's not part of the sermon. We can talk about it later, one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Uh, why, though? Why? Let's get back on track. Why is faith in Jesus the only way? Why is that the only way you can overcome the world? Because it definitely is. I want you to look at verse 5. He says, who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? John's not asking because he doesn't know. The Bible never asks a question that it doesn't already know the answer to. It's a rhetorical question. He says, who is it that can overcome the world except the one who believes in Jesus Christ? That's the only way. And I want to know, why is that the only way? Why is it the only way you can overcome death? And here's why. I need you to listen up really closely. If you've been in church all your life, you've never been in church until tonight. It doesn't matter. We all need this. The reason why Jesus Christ is the only way for you to overcome the world, faith in him, is because he's the only one who conquered death. He's the only one who ever went into the ground but then came back out on his own power. You say, well, Lazarus came out. Yeah, Jesus told him to come out. So it ain't Lazarus, it's still Jesus. Jesus is the only one that has conquered death. You see, here's the problem with faith in anyone else or any other belief system. Here's why it's futile. It's because everyone and everything else is still broken and unable to conquer death. See, Romans 5 talks about sin entering the world through one man, and that one man was Adam. But then through sin, death entered the world. And now death is spread to all men. So here's what you need to understand about yourself and any other belief system or philosophy out there that does not have Jesus as the hero of the story is that it's all operating with broken human beings. So every single human being ever to be born, except for Jesus, um, is a sinner. And so when they sin, they are actively bringing in, according to Romans 5, bringing in death with them. So you can't actively be the problem and the solution. It's not possible. I say it a lot, but a, a, like a broken lawnmower can't fix itself. Someone needs to fix the lawnmower. It's not going to fix itself. That's the problem with everyone and everything else other than Jesus, is that they are part of the problem. They can't be part of the solution. Here's the great thing about Jesus. Jesus never sinned, which means that he didn't participate in bringing death into the world through sin. And he's the only one to rise from the dead, which means he's conquered death. And if you're a thinking person, which I hope you are, every Christian should be, you might be saying, that's great that Jesus conquered death, but what does that mean for me? How can I conquer death? How do I do it? The answer is to stop trusting or having faith in, there's that word, faith, whoever believes, stop believing in your own broken self for salvation and place your trust, place your belief, your faith, whatever word works best for you, they all mean the same thing, put it in Jesus for salvation. Let me use an imperfect analogy, hopefully it'll work for you. Uh, we all know the scene in the movie where... Um, or a book or whatever. It's just commonplace where this lowly person with no prestige or class or money or whatever, just kind of a lowly person, he shows up at this gathering, whether it's a party or a club or a, you know, whatever it may be, a, a game, um, and he doesn't have what it takes to get in. Right? There's an awkward scene like I want in, and the doorman's like, no, you can't come in. 
But then we always see the friend who has whatever it takes to get in. They got the prestige, they got the money, they got the status, whatever it is. They got the power, and they say, hey, he's with me. Let him in. And the doorman's like, oh, all right. And so the lowly person comes in. Now, I realize this is imperfect, all right? It's an imperfect analogy. But this is us going to heaven. You have no right whatsoever to overcome death and to make it into heaven. You just don't have it. You don't have what it takes. What it takes is a perfect, sinless Um, humble life. You are the opposite of that, and so am I. We are not perfect. We are far from perfect. You know it best. We are not humble. We are proud. We think we can attain salvation on our own. We do not have what it takes to get in. But if we will lay down our pride, Jesus will be at the door of heaven saying, He's with me. Yeah, He can come in. My righteousness covers Him. So on that great day of judgment, when God is separating um, the goats from the sheep, We get behind Jesus. We say, we, a long time ago, stopped believing in our own righteousness. We're with him. We're we're banking on the fact that Jesus' life really was true, and that he lived a perfect life, and that his righteousness can be mine. And from the Bible, we know that God will say, okay, you're in. You can come in. So that's the answer to, well, how can I overcome the world? Put your faith in. In Jesus, associate yourself with him. Lay down your pride of trying to conquer death on your own through your own mind or your reason or doing good things or appeasing whatever deity it is that you're thinking about. Lay it all aside and just have faith in Jesus. And here's why it's not just faith in generalities that can save you. Because your faith is only as good as the object that you're placing it on. You can have faith in a lot of things. Some of you have faith in Dallas Cowboys and you're learning your lesson, right? (laughs) See what I mean? It's a perfect example. You don't put your faith in things that can't come through. Faith in generalities doesn't work. You gotta, it's only as good as the object you're putting it in, and we've got to put it in sinless, perfect Jesus. It is this specific faith in Jesus that can over come the world, John says. Uh, But we can't end here. We can't end here. It'd be great. Like, okay, we can overcome the world by placing our faith in Jesus, but we still have a life to live. And Dan's been talking about that a lot. Jesus doesn't just save you so you can know how it is that you were saved or to sit pretty until death comes knocking on your door. He saved you for a mission. And we have to know, what does it look like for someone to have faith in Jesus? Now that we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, what does it look like for us to live and to interact with the people that we come into contact with in our daily life? John is always, as you you well know, he is always concerned with um, making sure we know what it really looks like to be a Christian. John tells us um, in these verses, we're going to read it here in in 1 through 3, but just so you know where we're going He tells us in these verses that having faith in Jesus looks like loving God and his children. Look at 1 through 3. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So where I want to go now is to talk about true love, okay? We're we're in with faith. We are in the family of God. We have been born of him because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But now John wants to say, what does that look like? What does a life of faith look like? And here's what he's saying. Faith looks like love. That sounds a lot like what Dan's been preaching, right? We don't plan these things. Faith looks like love. They are the two pillars of New Testament Christianity. You cannot have faith without love. You cannot have love without faith. It's what it all stands on. They are two sides of the same coin. Only Christianity, this is super important for us to hear. Only Christianity teaches people how to love others well and in the most beneficial way possible. What do I mean by that? Maybe the most crucial question in our country right now is this. What does it mean to love someone? Or what does loving someone look like? Now, it's always been a crucial, crucial question, right? To how, do you, how do you love someone? What does that look like? But now, in our country right now, for our own purposes, our own American um, future, with tolerance at such an elevated high position right now, this is a super important question. What does it mean to love someone? What does loving someone look like? John has told us what it looks like to love someone. He says this, 
By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. So if you want to love people well, and it's not just the children of God. That's like we've been talking about, the bare minimum. You want to know you're a Christian, you love the children of God well. But all the other people are included in this, all right? Not as literal children of God, but if you want to love humans well, then love God and obey His commandments. That's the biblical way. We'll get to the world's way of looking at it first. He's defining loving God as obeying God's commandments. Why is that? Why is our love for God shown through the, through the obedience of His commandments? Here's why. Because God's commandments are an extension of Himself. It's hard-pressed for me to find a kid in our youth group who says they love their parents and never do anything they tell them to. Hard-pressed to find. That's not possible. You obey the ones that you love. You respect them. You honor them. God's commandments, His law is an extension of Himself. You want to know what I am like? I am perfect. I am righteous. I am all of the law. And that's why it's so impossible for us to ever keep the law. That's why Paul says that the law just increased sin. Because compared to God and His righteousness revealed through the law, we are nothing. And so if you want to love God, you obey God. We obey Him. But what happens when our world shows that they have no love for God in the fact that they do not obey His commandments? What happens then? What we get is a bunch of people who are not loving people well or rightly. They think they are, but they aren't. Because our world has forsaken love for God, they have no true source for love. So they grope for all other means. And the biggest one is this. Love is accepting others. To love someone is to accept them. And if you don't accept them, and by accepting the world means approving. So if you don't accept someone, then you don't love them and you hate them. And so we are set up with an impossible, an impossible uh, equation to figure out how can I love, if, if loving is just accepting and approving everything everyone does, what do I do when what they're doing I don't approve of? What happens when what they're doing is wrong? It goes against maybe laws that we have or definitely the morals that we gain from the Bible. We start running into all sorts of problems when we try to love the world like the world, um, or when we try to love others like the world says to do. What I always wonder about is uh, when it comes to the world's definition of love is what do you do when what someone is or what they're doing is affecting their well-being, my well-being, or my morals, or our laws, or whatever it may be. This belief creates all sorts of problems. Love in our culture now is, hey, just let people do whatever they want to do. Just accept them. Whatever makes them happy, don't let that bother you. That's them. Let me just give you a brief example. I always use this one because it's, it's, uh, it's vivid, and it, I think it, it gets the point across well. Let's say loving is just accepting someone for who they are and whatever they like doing and however they like passing their time. There's all sorts of people in our world. Uh, Dan talked about them this morning, people who like to commit adultery. That's just what they do. They have jobs, and they keep. maybe some of them have families, and maybe they're very upstanding citizens in their communities. We've seen a lot of them upstanding citizens, we thought, in our own government. But they... Um, they are happy when they commit adultery on people. And so you'll find this group of people who says, look, I mean, my philosophy says I have to just be okay with that. I have to, I mean, it's what makes him happy, right? I mean, you just got to let him do it. You can't say anything. But I wonder if those people would hold to that premise if that dude finds their wife. If he comes knocking on someone's door and wants to sleep with that wife. Now, all of a sudden, I don't think that they're going to hold up to, hey, just do what makes you happy. I think that guy's going down quickly. I would hope so. See, that's a problem. Because now they're faced with this friction. Do I really believe that love is just accepting and approving whatever they want to do? Or do I go after this dude? All sorts of problems. Here's where the world's definition of love rears its ugly, ugly head. It's an excuse to keep doing whatever I want to do. Because if I stand up under the guise of, hey, I won't judge you, then you can't judge me. And so a lot of people say, hey, you can do whatever you want, but in return, I'd like you to tell me you can do whatever I, or I can do whatever I want. 
falls apart very quickly. You see, when you unloose your anchor of uh, the definition of love, like, look, you want to love people, John says, you want to love people, love God. You unhook that anchor that is God, you are wandering out in a sea of subjectivity. You have no anchor for your soul, as Hebrews calls it. You have no anchor for right or wrong. Our culture will try to tell you, you can derive right or wrong from other places. No, you can't. God is right. Everything is judged by Him. He is the definition of good. He is where we get our understanding of right and wrong, good and evil. You do away with Him. Now you're only loving people a little. Let me show you logically what it looks like. If you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then you don't believe of the heaven of the Bible, because that's where God is, okay? If you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then you don't believe in the heaven of the Bible. If you don't believe in the heaven of the Bible, then you only believe in a small fraction of life. Because like I said earlier, every human that is born lives on for eternity. And we know that here on earth now, we live 75, 80 years in this country. So if you don't believe in God and therefore heaven, and therefore the majority of life, then you're only loving people for a small fraction of their life. It's like, it's like uh, giving birth to a child and only loving them till they're two. You follow me? To not care where someone spends eternity and to not care about the consequences that their actions are going to merit one day in eternity is to love a child until they're two or three and to not care one bit about the remaining 73 years of their life. That's sad. We reject that notion, though. We reject this notion. And I hope to goodness you reject this notion with vehemence. I hope that you know what you believe and that you know loving is not just accepting someone. To really love someone, you've got to tell them when what they're doing is wrong and it, it, it is going to incur hell upon them. That's true love. That's how you love people well. Here's the deal with the world's love. It only loves when it's convenient for them. You know you're a true believer when you obey God and you love God and therefore people, even when it's inconvenient to you. Because you're no longer, your convenience doesn't matter anymore. The day you signed up to be a Christian, your convenience, look, look a lot of us don't know this, all right, and we're, and we're not living like it, but let me tell you that when you signed up to be a Christian, you checked your convenience at the door. It's not number one goal anymore. The sad reality is that a lot of us are still living as if it was. That's why you're miserable. That's why I'm miserable when I do it. If I check my convenience like I'm supposed to at the door, my comfort, my, hey, I'm big shot number one, the life goes a lot smoother. But the world's definition of love doesn't do that. So it's hard sometimes to follow God's commandments. And here's, uh, if you're reading this in verse 3, you say, wait a second. It says his commandments are not burdensome, right? So why are they? Why do they seem to be burdensome sometimes? Well, here's the truth of the matter. Um, our flesh still wars against our spirit. So Christians now, um, it's, like we're, it's almost like we're spiritually schizophrenic. We've got the flesh and we've got the spirit. And they're warring against each other all day long. And it is because we still have that, those fleshly desires with us. We're not enslaved by them anymore. They don't have power over us. They will not win in the end. But they're there. They are there because they are there. Every day we have this war going on inside of us, which makes sometimes following God difficult. It's not that the commands of God are burdensome. It's because we have our fleshly desires still with us that makes them burdensome sometimes. You follow me? There's that war. That's why Paul talks about beating up his body in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He says, I pummel my body to make it do what I want. If you didn't know that Christianity was like that, you have been duped, and you are probably not fighting the good fight of faith well. you got to know, we don't come here to just be happy and jolly with one another and get to see our friends. Like, that's good. It's good for this to be a place of laughter and all that kind of stuff. Look, churches that don't laugh are dead, all right? So we know that our church is alive. But look, this is spiritual warfare zone here. The enemy hates it when you come here. That's why he tries to derail you on your way here, fighting with your spouse or with your kids or worrying about jobs. This is a warfare zone here. Sunday school, Sunday school teachers, look, this is a warfare here. We're not here to get through the curriculum. 
We're not here just for me to teach and, uh, you know, I get to go home and, oh, okay, I'm done with another sermon. No, this is like serious stuff. So no, the commandments of God absolutely are not burdensome. And if you've ever followed through on a command of God, even when it was hard, you know there was joy on the other side, amen? It's like, hmm, feels good. feels good to be living in joy right now instead of shame and guilt and condemnation. So we know. The enemy tries to lie to us. Oh, they're burdensome. You don't want to do that. You want to be free. No, they're not burdensome. You're the one making them burdensome. Once we obey God, there is so much joy. We're going to end with this. Look, why, why does John just not say, hey, look, here's how you can overcome the world. Faith. Have faith. Why does he not say that? It would have been a shorter message, right? Some of you are like, yeah. But why does he not say that? Why does he not just say, hey, if you want to overcome the world, have faith? Why does he include all this stuff about loving? Here's why. Because God is not concerned with you just winning. He's concerned with you winning well. Now, I haven't done an exhaustive uh, study on all the world religions, but I'm willing to bet that Christianity, if not the only religion in the world, Okay, and, and try to bear with me calling it a religion. We, I realize that it's a relationship, maybe yada, yada, right? Um, but it's the only one, I would think, that not only uh, wants you to win and everyone else be damned, but it wants you to win well. You see, because the bottom line is that only people who believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God are going to heaven. That's truth. So only those people at the end of the world are going to pass through into the new Jerusalem. But God set it up in a way for us to win well, that along the way, it's not just chaos and and just burnt bridges all behind us and severed relationships and just hatred towards us. I know that's a lot of the result from Christianity, and that's terrible. But God set it up in a way that we would leave behind love and peace and hope and mercy and grace and goodness following this? He doesn't want you to just win. He wants you to win well. Look, someone has to lose. That's reality. But Christianity is set up in a way that we don't hold it over people's heads. We love them. And if you want to love people, you got to love God. If you want to love God, you've got to obey His commandments. So tonight, John's message has been about overcoming the world. I hope that you would want to do that. Overcome the world. How are you going to do it? You're going to do it through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And once you have faith, you're going to know that you have faith. Here's how you love the children of God. How are you going to do that? You're going to love God well. How do I love God well? You obey His commandments. That's super simple for us. Thank goodness John was simple for us. Let's pray. Jesus, I first want to thank you for overcoming death. Man, you know, a lot of the times, God, in my own life, I don't really realize that I'm just dust. That I will return there one day. And how fragile I am. And how futile my attempts are to set myself up as king of the universe. But God, in those rare moments when I see that, I think, wow, how on earth am I going to overcome death? And those are the moments when I'm so thankful for your word and for your son Jesus who overcame death for me. And I pray for everyone here. I pray that they would all, if not already, put their faith in Jesus, lay down their pride in their own seemingly good works and trust in Jesus Christ as the only way to the Father. And God, once we are in the family of God, help us not settle for comfort, for leisure, and for smiles on our faces all the time. God, help us go to war for our neighbors that they wouldn't have to go to hell. God, help us live well. Help us love people well. Help us understand that we can only do that through loving you and obeying you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll stand with us, we're going we're gonna to sing one last song. Um, it's our custom here to, I want everyone to do work in their heart with the Lord, not just someone who's visiting or not a believer, everyone.
The altar is open if you want to come pray. Um, our basket here for offering is still here. And I am down here in the front if you have any questions. If you want to lay down your pride and trust in Jesus to overcome the world for you, I'm here to talk about that with you. But let's all sing.